Uh, welcome to episode one of Rear Naked Radio. I'm one of your hosts, Jamie Kilstein. And I'm the other host, Drew Weatherhead. Uh, guys, this is fucking incredible. We have uh, a huge show for our first show. Uh, Kenny Florian, uh, who you guys know from, obviously, BattleBots, um, <laughs> is here. Uh, also, from the Ultimate Fighter, UFC, Fox, uh, and back uh, as, like, a head jiu-jitsu coach running his own school and competing again um just so you know who the fuck we are um we'll do this introduction once i'm a, a reluctant stand-up comedian uh who's been on rogan conan all that um but my actual love is jiu-jitsu uh brown belt came up under marcelo garcia coached at henzo gracie los angeles coaching now uh helping out uh, with anthony burchek at 10th planet um, Tucson and co-host of Rear Naked Radio. Yeah, and Drew Weatherhead here again. I run and created Because Jitsu, so uh, big into the meme scene. Also comedian, but not of the stand-up variety per se. But um, I'm a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I run a school. It's where I'm recording at right now. Uh, that's my full-time gig, but between Because Jitsu and the school, uh, I run tournaments as well. I got my, I got my damn hands in everything Jiu-Jitsu, so I'm super thrilled to be on here with Jamie. He's, he's fucking awesome, and this Real show quick. is going to be awesome. Do you guys call it meme scene? Is that what memers call it? <laughs> I don't know. Every, every memer is a little bit different, and to be honest, they're all kind of weird, so we don't really talk to each other. What if they kick you out of the scene for talking about it? It's like a fight club problem. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we want to jump into the interview with Kenny because he was fucking great. Um, just so you guys know what to expect, uh, we have great guests coming up. So like uh, here on Gracie, we're going to interview this week. Um, Kevin Lee reached out to me after getting like the bonus uh, on a card with Masvidal and Diaz, which is insane. Um, and we really want to – we don't want it to be – interviews where they're just talking about who they're fighting the next week because by the time i see those interviews like the tournament's over and i'm like fuck i don't know like what they're talking about i want to hear about people's mindset i want to hear about their struggles um i want to talk about like heavy shit that i've gone through how jujitsu helped me with depression and being suicidal and you know shit that you guys can probably relate to more if you're not uh like a high level competitor yeah, and you know what really got me stoked about this podcast is obviously I got a fellow comedian, so it's going to be fun. It's going to be funny. But also, not only is it going to be insightful, like Jamie's saying, we're really interested in mindset and uh, how people sort of live their life around jujitsu. And on that point, we want to get people that are also not necessarily like deep into the competition scene, but also just jujitsu adjacent. So like people like uh, comedians that are blue belts or um, celebrities that train. Um, yeah. and we've got lots of people that are, that are going to be lining up for this podcast. So it's, I think it's going to be awesome. Yeah, so uh, you guys can help support the podcast, obviously. Subscribe on YouTube, uh, rate it on iTunes, all that jazz. Um, but also, we want you guys to be involved. We want a fucking community. We want a podcast that people are talking about at the gym every week. So you can send in your questions. We're going to answer some of those questions after uh, the interview with Kenny Florian. We got some really good ones this week. Um, you guys all follow Drew on Instagram. Um, I, uh, my Instagram's at the Jamie Kilstein. So you can write both of us. We'll compile questions every week. We'll answer, uh, hopefully, most of them um, on the show. And that's kind of it for me. All right. Well, let's get to Kenny. Fuck yeah. Cool. Kenny, thank you so much for doing this, man. Of course. We, uh, we're no Jonah Hill. Yeah. <laughs> that was so fucking cool on your Instagram. Uh, I didn't know. Uh, I, I, I heard he was doing jujitsu, but I had no idea he was doing it uh, with my buddy. I didn't know he was doing it over at your place. Yeah, I've been training with him for, I don't know, at least around six months or so. And um, he was training with um, a black belt of mine in New York City, Josh Griffiths, a clockwork Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And um, he, you know, now is living in Los Angeles. And, you know, I, I was just really impressed. You know, I... I think that for a lot of people, just for any regular person to come into the gym and sign up and do jujitsu, I think it's a pretty intimidating thing. And for someone coming from his background and, you know, doing what he does to 
just kind of really dive into jiu-jitsu and want to learn something completely new and really fucking challenging. Yeah. Um, I think says a lot about who he is. And, you know, you, you, I couldn't have met like a more genuine, grateful and good person. Like oh. he, he's the real deal, man. That's awesome. Yeah, dude, I was thinking about that um, when I started coaching and, you know, I'm not a big guy and suddenly I'm coaching uh, at this like pretty well-known gym and to see grown adults, especially like jacked dudes, put on a fucking gi and a white belt. Yeah. Like they look like, like I didn't do that since I was like doing like a karate class at like my elementary school. And it takes like a level of humility, even if you're not, super famous to like put on that fucking white belt do you think there's something because i noticed with jujitsu people um there's a lot of really creative people who are attracted to it um and a lot of outsiders sort of assume it just attracts these alpha bros um what is that kind of connection between almost a creative nerd type personality and then like a sport where you're you're trying to pop limbs Jeez, i mean it's a pretty deep question but you know i think that um, you know, in, in at our core, I, I think we're all kind of artists in some way, shape or form. We're all trying to interpret this thing called life that we're dealing with. And I, I think that um, something like jujitsu, you know, and there's other things, but I think something specifically like Brazilian jiu-jitsu really unifies that mind, body and spirit. And I think that in a day, in a time where we are all kind of looking for ways to check out and not be present. Yeah. Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, like surfing and, and things like that, um, calls on you to only be present. There's someone who's trying to uh, choke you. There's someone who's trying to put their sweaty chest on your face. Like, you better be present. You better be aware <laughs> of what's going on. And I, I think it, it makes you feel alive, right? And I think um, – those are the things that I think at our core, whether we realize it or not, we're, we're calling for and we're asking for ourselves. Life is difficult. Life is challenging. We don't have control over a lot of things out there. Chaos will come into our life. Into our life. How we handle it is important. And mm -hmm. I think jiu-jitsu allows us to find that stillness, to find that composure, to find that skill um, to, or to train that skill, uh, to learn how to deal with that kind of stuff. That was so poetic and philosophical. <laughs> we could end right there, but yeah, I'd like yeah, to go yeah. a little bit deeper. <laughs> Good night, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, with Jonah specifically, like I've, I've followed, um, Russell Brand, who's also doing the, the jujitsu thing, got his blue belt this year from Hodger Gracie, pretty fucking yeah. awesome. Um, but same thing like his big takeaway that i've i've watched some interviews with him talk about it is that there, it's it's a pl level playing field no matter how famous you are no matter how scared you are no matter how bro you are um you have to react to somebody grabbing you trying to choke you so and they're gonna do that especially yeah. at the white belt level where everybody's starting it's the, it's the oldest trope in the book is let's just roll light yeah, yeah. Lasts for about <laughs> two seconds it doesn't matter who you are then it's just yeah. game on right <laughs> famous famous last words and you know i would challenge any other sport out there uh, as well there is nothing like jujitsu that unifies so many different people from all walks of life onto the mat like if you came to our gym over at meraki brazilian jitsu and in, in in LA, uh, and, and it goes for a lot of academies. Uh, Jamie, I know you know this. I mean, think about, you grab 20 people in the gym who are on the mat, and they're all from different backgrounds. They all have different jobs. They all look different. They all are from different places in the world. Um, they all grew up differently. Uh, it's, it's crazy that something like Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu can unify so many different people to come together and share something which is pretty beautiful man oh dude i mean look i'm doing this jiu-jitsu podcast with drew so i can like slowly moonwalk my way out of politics <laughs> but yeah. that i mean there's a there's something political to that too where when i was only hanging out in brooklyn with people who totally agreed with me um and was sort of in this echo chamber i was not even giving a chance to so much of the population. And once I got to jujitsu, which at first you're very apolitical because you're not going to walk into a place as a white belt with a bunch of people who can kick the shit out of you and be like, here are my thoughts on abortion. Um, 
But then you suddenly realize, oh, one of my best training partners is like a hardcore conservative or one of my best training partners was down at Occupy Wall Street or, you know, whatever. And you start to realize that, oh, all of this bullshit that happens on social media pitting us against each other in a weird way, uh, trying to beat the crap out of someone you disagree with uh, will bring you closer than you ever could have thought. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. I mean, you know, people like to point to golf as something that kind of uh, equates to jiu-jitsu, but Ugh, just who does that? Same. How many people can afford to go and play like, you know, to eight rounds of golf or whatever the hell it is? Like, you know, I, I don't know. For jiu-jitsu, again, there's something just very pure about it that um, I think gets everyone to really respect each other. And again, I, and, and also everyone's doing the same thing. No matter what you do in your life, no matter where you're from, everyone there on the mat is trying to improve some aspect of their life. They're trying to evolve. So in that aim, they all kind of have that same goal, e even no matter what their political, religious, uh, you know, background, whatever it is. Um, how can you not respect someone like that? Right. Yeah, yeah I agree. I think that um, the ubiquity to jujitsu stems from everybody has a body and it's kind of like a live action video game where your body's your controller. So if you got a body, you can play. And mm -hmm. everybody, like I was saying, has the same joints. They all need blood to their brain. And yeah. that the playing field is level at that point. And then it's just learning how to play the game better every time you come, which is super um, encouraging for people that don't know how to do it to start. But it's also very addictive because you, you want to climb that ladder as fast as you can. Stop getting the, the shit choked out of you, you know? <laughs> 100%. 100%. Um, Kenny, I had a question for you. One of the things I really like about even before we became friends, um, on your social media is you kind of balance this like chilled out jujitsu guy. Um, but there's a lot of tradition, um, that I think you still really respect and honor. And you always had kind of like, uh, like a Bruce Lee vibe in, 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 in the way you spoke. Were you, you know, because I'm sure we'll talk about your early UFC days, but were you uh, inspired by UFC type stuff to get into jiu-jitsu? Or did you like grow up on more martial art movies and stuff like that? And, you know, even though they're fiction, I think if we're all being honest with ourselves, like that inspired most of us to start this. Uh, for sure. I, I think we're all kind of driven by a certain story or a certain mythology. Um, and, you know, for me, I definitely was very driven and intrigued by martial arts culture. Um, you know, watching Bruce Lee movies, watching Kung Fu theater on the weekends with my brothers is what got me into do uh, you know, got me into a karate and kung fu school when I was younger. And to me, that was more realistic than, you know, the Superman story or, you know, the X-Men or whatever, as cool as that was. Right, right. To me, it was, it was more realistic. So my superhero was Bruce Lee or, you know, Chuck Norris or, you know, these martial artists that could genuinely do some amazing things. Um, I think, as far as that reality of how effective certain martial arts skills were, um, I, I think, you know, maybe there was um, a little bit of confusion on my part and a lot of other people's parts of what was really effective in combat. And I think the Kung Fu is why you got so good at Jiu Jitsu. <laughs> well, you know, I, I think when I first saw the, the, the first UFC, it kind of, it brought me back to that big question right. of like, Oh, wait a sec, let's really find out what is effective, what, what really is effective. And growing up a pretty scared kid and, you know, dealing with a lot of social anxiety, I, I felt like I, I needed to, instead of run away from that fear, I needed to eventually run towards it and um, find some security within myself. And uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu um, really gave that back to me. And I think also, like, you know, I've always – Felt that I was a martial artist, not a fighter. Uh, you know, not you know. I, I loved athlete, you know, athletics, and I, I grew up an athlete playing soccer and tennis at a pretty high level. But um, to me, martial art. Anytime I did martial arts, even as as I was a young kid, that was the closest I ever felt to a religious experience. You know, that to me was like, you know, nothing else mattered. The 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 world was martial arts for me at that moment. And that was it. So it, it brought me a focus and an energy that I really um, couldn't describe at the time. 
So did you start off when you were getting into martial arts, where, whatever age you were at, did you start off with a grappling style or a striking style? And at what point did you start blending them together? Yeah, I, I did uh, what was called a Shaolin, um, Shaolin Kempo Karate. So it was kind of um, a combination of Kung Fu and Kempo Karate. And um, I was probably around nine years old. Um, my mom came in with all five other of my siblings. So six of us all signed up. And, um, you know, my dad was a black belt in judo and did it all through medical school and wanted us all to learn how to defend ourselves. And, you know, so that was kind of the backdrop of which I kind of grew up as well. So, um, yeah, I, I just, that, that's how I started. And then eventually as I became really busy with soccer, you know, traveling was, was a little bit difficult for me to go to, to martial arts. So, um, I was traveling all over the country and playing soccer all the time that I just couldn't keep up with my martial arts um stuff which was kind of shitty i felt i felt you know like i really missed that and it wasn't until i got into college i think i was like 19 20 years old that i did um a brazilian jiu-jitsu seminar with hoist gracie nice. and then from there i just couldn't i couldn't stop thinking about jiu-jitsu i i literally was obsessed since the time i woke up to the time i went to sleep that's all i wanted to think about it's all i wanted to do what was it at the um because he's actually he's he, he's one of the the main dudes that i actually haven't trained with uh most people cite hoist gracie as like seeing them on like seeing him on ufc as inspiring uh yeah. them to start jiu-jitsu or martial arts but what was it about that seminar specifically that like hit you where you were like oh fuck this is it i wanted to learn it and i didn't have access to it as far as i knew in my area and you know, my brother and I saved up um, some money and we drove out to, uh, I think it was White Plains, New York, I think, um, yep. that area to do a seminar with Hoist. And um, I think it was, it was just the fact that, I don't know, I, I, I felt it could have been maybe anybody, but, you know, just seeing Hoist Gracie dismantle these massive dudes, um, I, I thought was, again, it was like meeting a superhero. And right. back then, if you knew Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, you were essentially a superhero. There was very few people on the planet that knew how to do Jiu-Jitsu in the United States. So it was like, I felt like I was doing this secret meeting of like learning these super magical skills that no one else knew. And yeah. to me, that was, that was really cool. And again, like no one knew what it was. No one knew what mixed martial arts was. Like I'd have to explain what Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu was a million times a day to people. Yeah, I, I, I want to circle back to something you said about getting bullied um, and, 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 and fear. I, I, I don't want to have a horrifying question of like your life trajectory when it comes to fear, but something I thought about, because we're probably going to have a lot of white belts and blue belts who listen to this. Um, there are different stages of fear in your jujitsu life. Um, I mean, Drew and I were just talking about this before we even went to air, um, about like, you know, you get your black belt and suddenly you're like, fuck, I don't want to get tapped or, you know, uh, by this person or, or whatever. Um, what was kind of, what was your kind of trajectory of fear and, and, or were you just sort of so happy to be there? Cause I was almost less scared as a white belt cause I was just fucking psyched. And then it was almost like the, the, the more I got promoted, you can torture yourself. And I think that's why a lot of people quit. Yeah. I, I think my initial, um, my initial entry into jujitsu was such that I think I, you know, ignorantly, uh, maybe, um, I believed in jujitsu so much. I, I looked at a guy like a hoist Gracie and I said, why not me? Why, why can't I be good at jujitsu? He, he looks like me. He's not, you know, not, he doesn't look like anything special. Why can't I be good at jujitsu? And I really took to it and believed in it a, a thousand percent. And right. I just knew that I needed to learn it, drill it, repeat it, and um, have the right mindset and, and the right student mentality. And, you know, at the same time, I'd be lying to you if I didn't say I was scared when I, when I rolled. And, um, sometimes still do, um, for sure. But I, I always try to remind myself of what's important, which is I'm doing this to learn as much as possible. And I'm learning this to be as good as I can possibly be. And I think we, we get it twisted when we start comparing ourselves. Um, I think that's the biggest thing, you know, for any white belt or blue belt or any belt that's out there. I think we have to be careful in comparison. Um, 
we, we get caught in it. And we also have to realize that everyone is different in how they approach their jiu-jitsu. Everyone's jiu-jitsu um, will have a, a difference as well, that there is not one jiu-jitsu for everybody. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't believe that. We, we are, it's a martial art. You know, there, there's a lot of high level instructors that tend to teach like, if you do one and you do two and you do three, it will equal this. And yeah, yeah it's okay. You know, system, systematized training is cool and it's effective, but it only reaches a certain level. Jiu-jitsu is an art at the end of the day. And when you see it as an art, it is limitless. And, and I think that's the important thing is, yes, there are efficiencies that we can hone in on. But as soon as you hone in on efficiency, what do I do? I become more efficient and more aware of your efficiency and of your technique. And now you have to step up your game. So where are we going with our jiu-jitsu? It's limitless. Martial arts, combat sports, combat in general, there is no end. And this is what, you know, I'm not saying anything different than what Bruce Lee was saying way back in the day. He was way ahead of his time. But to think that, you know, we, we've reached this pinnacle of jiu-jitsu, like, we're not even close. This is still an extremely new sport. And I think a lot of instructors are fucking terrible and they don't know how to communicate it. And they don't really know um, even how to describe certain things or what jujitsu is or what we're doing to actually get better. I think, you know, there's a lot of, you know, um, inefficiencies in how we teach and how we understand and how we explain things and how we train there's a lot of silliness in the martial arts as well that I think we carry on. So, you know, we have to balance tradition with um, the ability to advance our art and what we know as, as martial arts. Damn. Yeah, that's, that was intense. I felt like you're going to jump through the screen and grab me by the collar and start grappling. That was cool. What is wrong with you? What, wrong? <laughs> what are your insufficiencies? Yeah. Teach yeah. better, Drew. I had a yeah. funny thought when you're talking about Hoist Gracie. Can you imagine being Hoist Gracie in 1990? Was it three, four? And yeah. Uh, yeah. Dad, dad walks up to him and says, Hoist, we've chosen you to represent the family. And he says, that's awesome, Dad. I couldn't believe that you would pick me over all of these other great grapplers. I'm so, I'm so happy about this. It's like, yes, did you pick me because I have awesome technique and because I was rolling well with Hickson the other day? No, we picked you because you look like anybody can beat you. <laughs> and it worked. It totally worked. It was it brilliant. Worked. Yeah. It, it's it, it, it's like when you're at the bar and you're like that girl is too pretty for me you're just gonna shoot for like who looks accessible <laughs> and hoist was mr exactly. accessible <laughs> that's like when you, you say the thank you with the question mark you're like <laughs> thanks <laughs> what, what what do you think um that teaching thing you said really interested me because i'm a shitty learner um i don't believe that but okay dude so, so, i mean i got so lucky to come up under marcelo garcia because marcelo sometimes doesn't realize what a fucking god he is so sometimes we'll actually explain stuff with less detail than maybe some people would like and then just show it um and then you could get into it what he was great about is you know, one, he comes around to everybody and everybody gets helps. He's not like Marcelo Garcia. He's not inaccessible. He's not off in a corner. Mm -hmm. um, but also he has this guy, Paul Schreiner, who is like a Camarillo guy, helped Ryan Hall a lot, like kind of like yeah. almost in your Brilliant circle. instructor, yeah. So technical. So you had this like beautiful uh, synergy with them. Um, so I have taken privates or learned with some of the people who are supposedly the greatest technicians and teachers. And dude, I just completely space out. I, I, I have such trouble. Um, do you think that students just need to find the teacher or the coach that's right for them? Or were you kind of going somewhere where you think there's something that coaches need to get better at in general when it comes to communicating? Okay, so I, I think there, there's really two questions there, and I have kind of have, yeah. So in regards to your first question, I think that, yes, certain people are going to vibe with certain teachers, 100%. Some people, I need you to tell me exactly how to do it, tell me exactly how to do it, and then that's it. There's other people that work better conceptually. Um, like, tell me what the concept of, yes, what yes. am I trying to do here? I fall in that um, category. I think that's something that is long lasting and um, there's an incredible room for interpretation through that. So I, 
I try to teach that way as well. Some people look at me like with blank stares, like, no, just tell me what to do, man. Please, where <laughs> yeah, do yeah. I put my hands? You know, <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I try to balance the two things. Um, I, I think that the conceptual teacher is where we should be heading. Why? Because I think we have yet to really um, identify what we're supposed to be doing from certain positions. I think that we're not doing a good enough job of making um, descriptions for what we do and when we do it and, and, and why we do it. Um, I think jujitsu, if you look at how vast it is, it's extremely overwhelming. Like I, I want to take a deep breath just thinking about it. <laughs> um, there's a lot to it, right? Um, and you could spend many lifetimes trying to master it. But I think that um, making it less scary, I think, is the goal um, of the instructor, is how do we make it more approachable and easier to understand? And I think when you understand it, uh, it, it's way easier to deal with. Um, yeah, and that, that's, that's, that's my belief anyway. That's great. Yeah, that's a, a good point that I think, and I've talked about this on a, in other podcasts, why I believe that jiu-jitsu is exploding the way that it is. Um, not just in the numbers. The numbers are kind of derivative as time goes on, mm -hmm. but also just the efficiency like you're talking about. Like people are really starting to study from many different angles. But I think that the big key here is that a lot of it's online now. So you've got places like BJJ Fanatics and you've got uh, Digitsu and you've got YouTube, you know, you YouTube, fuck, yeah. anybody can just access this stuff, whether for a price or for free. And, and they can add that to their game that day. They can innovate it on it that day and upload something new. And I think that this uh, kind of like uh, melting pot of minds has never existed before, whatever, 10 years ago when YouTube popped on. You couldn't, you couldn't be more right. And I think that back in the day, um, you know, I didn't even have access to, to a, a, a VHS tape, you know, as far as instruction. And then later on, it was like, oh, you can get this VH, VHS tape series of instructors. And, um, you know, you had to wait for it to come in and you put it into your like little box and watch this grainy video. And um, it was not really organized. You had to rewind and fast forward to where you needed to go. And that took like a few minutes. It just wasn't efficient, right? And now we have access to so much information. Um, it's both a great thing. It's also, it can be a bad thing because I, you know, again, I don't, I don't think there's a whole lot of amazing instructors out there. I think there's a lot of technique knowledge, I think for sure. But, um, you know, you can also drown in that information very easily as well. I think that um, it's, it's an interesting thing, but there's no doubt, like when I, when I got my black belt, like I think the black belts of that generation would probably be like purple belts of this generation. Like, mm -hmm. you know, the, 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 the belts, the rankings, I think the, the guys are so much better today because of that. They have access to so much info. Like, you know, if you weren't aware of a technique, you know, and still to this day, if you're not aware of a technique, it's like getting tapped on the shoulder and like cold <laughs> clock. You know yeah. what I mean? And um, now everyone has at least seen pretty much everything and they're only like a blue or a purple belt. Like, Oh, I know about that stuff. We have white belts doing Baron Bolos and you know, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. The, uh, the, like the bootleg Pedro Hizzo VHS tapes are like the equivalent of like comparing to like YouTube is like comparing like Pornhub to like your, <laughs> your brother's hustler that was hidden in a tree house somewhere. Dude, hundred <laughs> percent. Like we had to work for that shit. We had to work for all. I stole all the UFCs from like blockbusters and like shit yeah, like that. Exactly. Uh, do you, do you have, uh, I just thought of a nerdy technical question when you were talking about YouTube. Do you have a, so I moved to Arizona. So I'm at uh, a 10th planet now with, uh, okay. Anth with Anthony Burchak. And it's great. Cause he's also okay. like an MMA guy, a wrestler guy, mm -hmm. but man, all the 10th planet shit is like, so new to me. Um, do you have a sort of technique when you are either trying to learn a new system or not even a new system, but like, let's say one month you're like, I really got to get my half guard on game or, 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 or Baron Bolo when that came out. Um, are you one of those guys who will 
force yourself just to play in that area until you start to get decent at it? Do you still play your game and incorporate it a little bit? Do you take notes? Um, do you have like a system that you like for retaining new stuff? Oh, oh for sure. You know, um, I, I am constantly trying to learn new things. Um, you know, I, I think that there's um, just a few unifying principles that applies across to all jujitsu or all grappling in general. Everyone likes to think that like, oh, like, oh, you're doing guard, but half guard's totally different. I don't believe that to be true. I don't believe that any of the guards are really different. I don't believe that any of um, a lot of what we're trying to do as far as takedowns and sweeps are any different. It's the exact same principles at play. That's cool. um, and I, I think that that's huge, but yeah, absolutely. Like I, I think that as a martial artist, we have to be extremely honest with ourselves of, you know, looking at your game and be like, all right, where, where are my weaknesses? What am I doing right? What am I doing wrong? Like a lot of times I'll do things like, let's say I'm successful against so-and-so and then successful against another person and successful against another person, but I don't feel right about it internally. Like I'm like, oh man, like, yeah, I'm sweeping them or I'm submitting them. But like, I don't really know what I'm doing. Like, I don't yeah. really know what I'm doing. You have to ask yourself that question. Like, are you aware of what's going on both offensively and defensively? Do you get the gist of what you're actually trying to do here for control, for defense, for vulnerabilities, uh, back and forth? Like, I think that's, that's essential. Because it's very easy for, this, for me to hide and be like, all right, um, today I'm going to be like working from the mount against you guys. Cool. Let's, let's like, and then I like leave the gym. I'm like, dude, I'm a beast. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? So gains. I, yeah, exactly. So I, I really just like, my goal is to get better. I don't give a shit if I'm tapping, getting swept, whatever, because at the end of the day, if I need to do it for real, you know, in a fight or a self-defense situation or a tournament or whatever it is, Guess who's going to look like an asshole? This guy. Yeah. So, so why why am I ignoring these things in training? What? So I feel good about myself when you know when I'm drinking my protein shake? Like, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> That's speaking of um, tournaments and looking like an asshole and all that good stuff. Yeah. Uh, I saw you posted that you were competing in the gi yep. recently, which got me super jazzed as a, a <laughs> gi nerd myself. I'm like, yeah, fuck yeah, we got Kenny in a gi. Let's do it. Let's see him <laughs> out there. Tell me more about that, because I remember you took a super fight a while back, and that was the last I heard yeah. about you competing before this post recently. So, so what's yeah. going through your head? Yeah, man. You know, um, it, it was fun. I, I, I um, said, you know what? I, I really want to do um, some tournaments, or I, I really wanted to do the Nogi World Championships in December, and I've been training and feeling good, and, um, you know, I, I just looked online for some tournaments in the area, and I was like, oh, this one's gi, but oh, I'll just do it, whatever. I'll just hop in there. And I entered the Long Beach Open and had some fun. And, um, you know, I, I had – my goal for that one really was just experiencing that and just being focused, it, giving my best for each and every match. That was, that was my only goal. And, you know, I, I ended up winning the tournament and stuff. And, but for me, it like, literally like it – I don't care if I like lost my first match. It, it was not about that. My only goal, um, my only goal was just going out there and, and competing hard and, and testing myself. And um, I'm going to do another tournament uh, this weekend. The SJ, SJJIF World Championships is coming up uh, in Long Beach as well. So I'm going to do that one. That one's going to be Nogi. And then I'm going to do the Nogi World Championships in December. So I just been, you know, training and having a lot of fun with my students and, and training partners. And, you know, I've been really trying to, um, you know, back when I met Ryan Hall, I think in 2014, 2015, I was just kind of starting to train again and get healthy with my back and, um, meeting him and talking to him. I, I realized I needed to really reorganize my jujitsu and do it and see it in a completely different way. And, um, you know, I really felt like I had to start again. Like I really felt like a white belt for a bunch of different reasons because physically I wasn't what I was before because of my back. And also I wanted to learn 
what real efficient jujitsu was. And in my opinion, you know, I, I feel and still feel that Ryan Hall is probably um, the greatest expression of jujitsu right now. Um, and there's other amazing practitioners, don't get me wrong, that are, are unreal. Um, but um, I, I really loved his approach and, and how he moves. And um, I can't do a lot of the things that he does, but I think he's given me a way to see jujitsu and, and interpret jujitsu for my own game. And, um, you know, that, that's, that's my goal every day is just trying to improve and get better and understand as much as possible. Dude, I texted, uh, I texted Ryan as one of the first people we wanted to get on that show. A every time I go train with him, I'm like, I guess I quit comedy and do jujitsu forever. <laughs> or, or when he gets like really into it, like if we go out to eat dinner, I'm like, I guess I want to just dole out street justice to anyone who, who wrongs a civilian. Like his sense of justice is so scary. <laughs> like fucking insane. <laughs> Oh my god! What 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 was it about him? Because I relate to this. Like I'm obsessed with him. Uh, yeah. What is it about either his style or just his um, uh, uh, personality or uh, 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 concepts to, like life concepts uh, mm -hmm. that made you like? What was it specifically that that he got you thinking about or reevaluating? You know, I, I think he's another one. You, you look at him and you're like, really, this guy. <laughs> This is the guy that everyone says is really good at jiu-jitsu. Okay, cool. Accessible. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> he is, he is um, just the most fluid jiu-jitsu practitioner I've ever felt. Um, his evolution as a martial artist is yeah. nonstop. You could train with him one month and train mm -hmm. with him the next month, and he's completely different, and his, I, has a uh, – changed a lot of the things of whatever was maybe vulnerable before has now been gone. Yeah. Uh, and then he'll go two steps further yet again, and then again, and then again. And to me, like that is what martial arts is all about. And, you know, I'm not proud of anything in my career besides getting better every single fight. That's the only thing that I wanted to do as a martial artist was improve. And, no matter whether I won or lost, the one thing I'm happy about in my career is that I was always a better fighter. I was always a better martial artist every time out. And th that, I think that really resonate, resonated with me and Ryan's approach and how he's constantly improving. And to me, that means he's onto something special and that he understands something that other people just do not. And um, I think that's what resonated with me. And we just we're able to share so much information back and forth that it was like, we, I, I felt like we both like kind of just shot up me, especially, I guess I'll speak for myself, but I know that I grew so much um, as a martial artist. And uh, you know, I, that's a guy that I'll share everything with. And he's been, you know, very forthcoming with his information as well. Uh, you know, so this is how we get better too, is like these friendships and these training um, partners, you know, my brother Keith, and you know, these are things that how we can push each other to improve. And, and when you test each other, you, ha you have to evolve and, and have to get better. And, and, and that, that's probably why. Awesome. Listening to you describe that, if I didn't know that Ryan was a person, and if I thought that Ryan was a disease or like a virus, Dude. it sounds like you're describing a virus or the CDC is trying to catch it and it keeps mutating, it keeps mutating. They're like, we thought yeah. we had it, and then it, it <laughs> mutated again. We need a new he vaccine. Just might be. That's, yeah. a great, that's a great analogy. The disease just used to triangle people at purple level. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Kenny, man, if you hadn't already, I was already wanting to interview Ryan. Now you've just solidified it in my mind. We got to get. Yeah. It's a yeah. Bot. You know what, Kenny? We got to go. We're going to go call Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We got to make a phone call real quick. But thanks, thanks for coming out, Kenny. Yeah. <laughs> no, but to totally honest, I'm a, a big fan. I've always been a fan of you watching your MMA career, even uh, watching you on Fox, you know, transition into that. And now it's like, it's super encouraging watching you now become this full-time instructor and really loving your gym. Cause that's what I do as a job too. So I, I really, uh, I vibe with that. I actually, uh, act like interior designed after Meraki. Oh, <laughs> for cool. my that's gym. Awesome. Yeah. I'll I kind of took that. that. Thank yeah. You beautiful. Much. Like very talk cool. about art. You did a really, really great job with that space. And I'd love yeah. to come down there and train one of these times. Always welcome. Um, to, it's the best. Be I, I, I have. It's great. 
I've, I've got to actually head here because uh, my own class starts in about eight minutes and I've probably got students behind me wondering why I'm just talking to the air. <laughs> right on, man. Thank you. You, you tell them you are talking to a friend of Ryan Hall's. I mean, <laughs> you were talking to uh, – Kenny, look, man, yeah, same for me. I just – I mean, we became friends and I, I feel like your friendship and just advice in life has been so helpful for me. But I also – just because uh, Drew brought up Fox, so we'll, 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 we'll talk about it next time you're on the show. But I just think it's so fucking cool that, like, you've had so many opportunities to sit back and have a cushy life if you wanted it. Um, and the fact that, like, you decided to open a school and taking it full circle to the beginning of this interview with, you know, Jonah Hill, who doesn't need to put on a white belt. Like, dude, you don't need to compete. There are a lot of people who have a school, who have their black belt, their UFC cred, and they go, well, what if I lose because I might, uh, it might hurt the business or it might, you know, whatever. Yeah. But the integrity you have towards jujitsu is just like, it's really rare, man. And, and, and we're thrilled that you, you, you came on our podcast. I really appreciate that. And, uh, thank you guys. And maybe we'll talk again soon. Fuck. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Anytime. Pleasure. All right. See you guys. Bye. Cool. Uh, so we're going to go to Q and a before we started recording, I was trying to explain to drew a jujitsu move. And I think this should be a new segment of the show, which is drew and Jamie poorly try to explain jujitsu over the internet without showing uh the move so, every single time a student starts saying well when i'm doing this and i'm doing that i'm like okay stop stop show dude, me my brain <laughs> just completely checks out i'm yeah. like i barely know my fucking left from my right i'm so dyslexic i have every learning disability like <laughs> known to man that's it, like that is my superpower is uh, you have all the learning disabilities i have all the learning disabilities like the the thanos super stones my yeah, wife, yeah yeah my wife dyslexia she... <laughs> autism depression <laughs> like oh. whenever and, my wife tries to say something secret in front of the kids she spells it out i'm like nope <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny the kid the, your kids just like she smelled she smelled snack dad yeah, and you're like exactly ah. <laughs> uh that's so funny yeah i totally have to see it that's why marcelo garcia was such a good teacher for me because he's really kinesthetic um like a lot of times i think he doesn't realize like he'll show something and he'll be like all right go and it's like oh hey marcelo you forgot step five which is be marcelo garcia because he'll just do something like incredible but he comes over and he shows you and he has such a good like uh feeling and awareness whereas when i train when i've trained with some of the like renowned instruct instructors like you know sean williams and john danaher uh a lot of times they'll be talking and they're like the left wrist and i'm like i'm done I'm done. <laughs> I'm like, I guess I, and like, then in my head, I'm like, well, I guess we space out for 20 minutes, wait for them to finish talking. Then the second we start rolling, just being like, professor, professor, can I just ask you a quick question? Do you actually hate dyslexics? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, oh, so this move. So here on Gracie, uh, who we're, we're going to be interviewing. Um, hopefully if we don't interview him today, he's literally like <laughs> disappearing for like three months on vacation with his like perfect family. Um, I have never forgot this move where when they lock their hands for a straight arm bar, you literally just like CPR compression their chest, put all of your weight on their, their chest and jump over to the other side and take the other arm. And it's such a violent, simple move. Um, just try it. You literally don't even, I couldn't explain it. Like what hand goes where, like you'll feel it. Where literally you're just stretched back and then you just go and you put all your way and you're like sitting like your ass just goes boom and like bounces off their chest and they go, which like loosens their grip as you're falling to the other side. It's a dope move. There's a few different sounds in jujitsu that are just the most acceptable sounds to hear when you're attacking and like a oof. It feels good. And it's the best. When you hear a cough after a triangle choke, you're like, yeah. Yeah. Dude, <laughs> how, how about when you have someone in a body triangle and they're trying to play it cool and then you just hear, and you slowly realize, like, <laughs> I'm going to fucking tap this purple belt with a body triangle. Sure, you'll give me your neck and let me choke you, but we know why you're fucking tapping out. Yeah. Uh, but then the other side to that, um, just so I don't sound like I'm actually cocky when I roll. The other side to that is, have you had the experience where you're going with someone who you think 
you've just created this story in your head and maybe it doesn't happen to you as much as like a black belt. Um, I mean, I bet it does, but this happened to me at Marcelo's one day where I, there was this dude who walked in, he had an American top team hoodie. He was visiting like giant cauliflower ears, probably Brazilian. And Marcelo goes, uh, go with James. And I was just like, fucking really? Uh, and in my head, I'm like, this guy's going to fucking kill me, which is horrible. You should never do that. And so I start going like really light and uh, I'm like stepping away from stuff. And then I hit like my fucking Marcelo knee cut pass. And the second I land, I hear him go. <sighs> and I just had this moment where I go, oh, I can I can be good. Like if I just actually believe that I'm good. Um, like there, there have been so many times, I'm sure you've experienced that, where you're with this bigger guy and you're like, this guy's kicking my ass and I just somehow ended up inside control. And then you just hear them go like, <sighs> and you're like, wait, am I making him, is that me? Am I making him tired? Like, does he have a medical condition? Um, and then suddenly you're- Dude, are you okay? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You want me to call for help? <laughs> I shouldn't be doing well. Uh, and then, but that's like- it's fucking hard sometimes. It's hard to like balance because you don't want to be cocky, but man, you don't want to be so self-hating where you like don't believe in yourself at all, you know? Yeah. You know where you get that at black belt is when you start rolling with other black belts, when you're new right. to the belt, because, um, you know, you're still trying to accept the fact that you represent like the greatest rank in this right. thing you've been doing for a decade. Yeah. And, and then you're going against people like, say a black belt you haven't rolled with before or you've never met or a traveling black belt. They come through the gym every now and again. You'll be like, okay, so now I get to find out that I'm not really a black belt and right. I'm going to die. Yeah, and of course, like in your head, you're like, all right, so this black belt's going to tap me out and he's probably going to take my belt and I guess he runs the school now and should I just tell... <laughs> That's right. You're flashing I just tell... back to feudal Japan where you're going to yeah, lose yeah. everything. Yeah, I guess my wife can finally have someone she can spell in front of in front of the <laughs> kids because like I'm not their dad anymore. Uh, and yeah, man. Man, and it's so crazy the pressure we put on ourselves, and and that we can do something that really is badass and hard and challenging and makes us tougher people, but still, like, yo, we still got those demons, and sometimes we got them worse, you know, than like your average person, because uh, we actually kind of put ourselves out there, you know. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we've all experienced getting shit kicked, so it's not that foreign a concept. Oh my God, I know, right? Um, all right. Well, that was, look, see, we even gave like a, a, a new sappy thing uh, before we even got to the questions. So you're welcome, audience. <laughs> all right. Well, we've got uh, three questions we're going to run over and try to point for them as much as we can, but uh, we'll, we'll fuck around a bit too. Sure. Uh, first one, why do white belts teach white belts i just experienced oh. this last night actually did um, you yeah did they, there was, there was a new white belt something? that came through um who had judo background so okay. he's wearing a you know air quotes white belts and um okay so he's he, he knows a bit on the ground he's not dumb he knows some stuff but he's teaching like the moment that he's partnered up and he's with, the new with, student yes yeah, and Ooh. and while they're rolling too, like everybody he's rolling with, he's telling them what to do and what not to do. I'm was like, okay. he uh, out of shape and stalling? No, but he um, definitely isn't used to being on the ground for more than fifteen seconds at a time. Right. Yeah. So he, he, he kind of peters out a couple to, minutes in. He kept trying to stand people up. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's fucking crazy. That's crazy. I don't want to digress too much because this is a great question, but like, dude, when I walk into a gym, a visiting gym that I've never been to, I fucking am just like so out of the way, happy to be here. Am I standing where I shouldn't? I'm so sorry. Uh, I roll like super chill. Um, I'm like, I don't care. Like, I have crazy. We'll do this in another episode. We should tell road stories. Mm. I have insane stories from visiting, like, MMA gyms especially. Um, but I just try to be, like, as fucking cool as possible. No fucking way on my first day, especially if I'm wearing a fucking white belt, am I going to be explaining, trying to teach shit. That's insane. <laughs> But it comes from fear. It doesn't come from him being an asshole. Yeah, it's true. And, and like I said, he has some understanding. But again, it's a new environment. He doesn't know what the other person knows. Um, no. 
and immediately starts teaching. But to, that's kind of a weird example. It happens all the time, just white belt to white belt. They train at the same gym and uh, maybe they have a move that has worked for them a bit. And so now they're the author of that move and they're going to let everybody right. know how to do it. Right. That, that's a problem at white they belt. They don't call it the white belt rear naked choke for nothing. <laughs> I promise there is not, there is no white belt out there outside of like a John Jones sandbagging style white belt who knows how to do something perfectly. It yeah. just doesn't happen that quick. And, you know, I mean, look, here's where it comes from. Sometimes it's really good intentioned or well-intentioned. Um, a hundred percent, you know, you could have a four stripe white belt and, uh, there's another white belt and they're fucking floundering. Right. I always told myself as a white belt, as a blue belt, even as a purple belt, I mean, sometimes you're in situations, man, like I've been partnered up with black belts and I'm like, oh, they're doing it wrong. Uh, and I have to really like think about pros and cons. Like, do I want to, and if I'm look, if I become friends with them, uh, like I've become friends with a black belt, um, and he wants my advice because a good black belts do if they recognize that someone, you know, is decent. Um, but I've been like, there've been sometimes I've like sat on it, but there've been some times where it's like, if someone is really struggling and I have the answer or I can give them, you know what I, you know what spiel I gave a little more where I was like, if I saw someone struggling, I wouldn't really show them the move. I'd always be like, Hey, Marcelo knows more than I do. But I was like, don't be fucking hard on yourself, man. I was like, I got my ass kicked for like, I didn't tap anyone out to blue belt. Like that's legit at Marcelo's. I didn't. Um, and I would always tell people that. And like, you know, even that seems kind of stupid to act like you have war stories as a white belt. Like <laughs> I've seen open micers at comedy clubs being like, ah, oh, the business isn't what it used to be. And it's like, what? You've been doing this for three months. What are you talking about? Um, but like sometimes, you know, that camaraderie is really good. But the answer, unfortunately, to uh, the, the person who wrote you on Instagram is jujitsu. You are literally you are a grown ass man or woman who has paid money to get beat up. Um, I mean, that is literally what people do who go to dominatrixes. Like, uh, <laughs> it's it, it's weird. And you're in this tornado of people who could just fucking have their way with you. Um, and you're getting your fucking ass kicked. And you partner up one day with someone who knows a little less. And you just go, oh, for fucking once. I cannot feel like an asshole for like the, I'm not scree I'm not yelping in pain as a child arm bars me. I'm not fucking like tying my belt wrong and coming out like a fucking idiot. Like for the first time I can be like for the triangle choke, you don't want to put your arm back here. And you just like, you, you just grasp onto that. Right. And I think that that is human and that is okay. When you become addicted to it, you know, when you become addicted to being like, maybe you're the top white belt, right? Maybe you're, and, and now you're getting off on like explaining stuff instead of learning, instead of, look, man, I mean, I've gone into schools as a Marcelo Garcia, as a fucking brown belt with like a t-shirt on. And I've had blue belts not know my rank because I'm not going to tell them. And they're like, hey, we do it this, like, you know, they're like, before I even try the move, they're like, just so you know. And I'm like, it's half sweet, but it's half like they're going with the new guy. Yeah. yeah. And they don't know if the new guy's going to kick the shit out of them. And they kind of want to like establish some kind of dominance first, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's fucking fascinating, to be honest with you. So to answer the question, uh, that's why white belts teach white belts. But to answer it further, don't do that. Oh yeah, that's a good. I should have just shut up. I went on for five minutes, and Drew could have just <laughs> Drew could have just said, "Stop it." That's the yeah. answer. Uh, I mean, yeah. Call the look. If you're a higher ranked person, that means you know the coach better, which means you can go, "Hey, coach," and like just call the coach over. Uh, that that's not bad. But yeah, don't do it. Especially don't do it when you're rolling. If someone, dude, even if someone asks you a question, you can be like, "Let's go over and ask the coach." You know what's awkward as a coach sometimes is when um, you're walking by watching groups training and you'll see the one guy be like, no, you're supposed to do it like this. And then you have to be like, 
no, actually, you're not supposed to do it like that. That's <laughs> rough. That's rough. I've had to do that a bunch. Yeah. Uh, and you're just like, hey, you're, you guys are both kind of right. And it's like, no, everyone's, uh, wrong. No. everyone's <laughs> wrong and sad. And now you feel like a fucking dick. Yeah, you feel like an asshole having to correct somebody who's trying to help somebody. But at the same time, they're just doing it wrong. Well, and also maybe that'll get them to fucking stop. True. True. Hopefully. You know? Um, next one, which is this one could be its whole episode. So we'll try to keep it a little bit short, but uh, I fucking can sense that passive aggressive that that was because my answer was too long. on the last question. <laughs> we, we start this section with, we're going to do it point form. Jamie's like, all right, so here's my feelings on life. Oh, uh, by the way, I willfully ignored that. I don't know if you saw <laughs> that I refused to acknowledge or I didn't sign on to that. <laughs> <laughs> Bitch, watch me. <laughs> <laughs> it all started with my father. Um, all right, you answer this one, Drew. Oh, God, because I got like nothing good to say about this. Feelings on PEDs in jiu-jitsu. So PEDs, for those not in the know, not on the on the bomba already <laughs> <laughs> is performance enhancing drugs. Uh, generally it's going to be steroids or uh, some sort of hormone replacement that basically gives you some sort of training edge. Yep. Um, the thing with jujitsu, uh, it's a not striking style. So the strength gains that you're going to get are not as, as effective as a striking style. If you're getting thought of that, if you're getting strength gains and you're allowed to shin kick someone to the fucking head, that's going to be a big advantage. Uh, right. If you get strength gains and all it does is make your buck a little better, right? Eh, it may not get you out of mount, you know? So here's the thing is- That's I, so interesting. I never thought about it that way. Yeah. Like you don't get the same gains in our sport. The thing that it does help though, and I, I've heard this from people er, on the low who use it, uh, right. no names- but it's very- AC Slater from that very <laughs> special episode of yeah. Kyle uh, Tara, the Bell. I'm talking about you. You know it. <laughs> uh, is at the top level, they train so hard, and they're they're doing like three sessions a day, twelve days a week. You know what I mean? It's just constant, and they beat their body up so bad that really all they're looking for is a faster recovery. And everybody's trying to find these body hacks, these health hacks to make their body recover faster, not to make them a superior athlete, just to keep them level, you know? Right. And that's something I think a lot of people don't know. Like you even reminded me of that because le legitimately, like I was kind of joking, but when I think of steroids, I think of Saved by the Bell where AC Slater <laughs> had to take steroids on the wrestling team and he would just go into these fucking roid rages on like Jesse and he was driving the group apart and I was like, this is terrible. And I think people think about that they think about like when i hear steroids i think of like a needle in the ass and then someone like slapping his girlfriend and like it like just that but with like the testosterone replacement and stuff like that you're right like a lot of people are craving recovery what i will say on this is i am definitely in the fucking mosfidal diaz ryan hall uh, Ronda Rousey camp of just like fuck steroids, you know, but it's also, it's kind of like weight cutting where when you're that high level and you're like, well, fucking everyone's doing it. Like weight cutting. Don't you wish like everyone could be like, Hey guys, if we just have a fucking gentleman's agreement about this, we can all not torture ourselves and like, you know, hide the sweet potatoes uh, every time we have to fucking compete. But one of the things that jujitsu really has to step. So that's like just my, you know, in a perfect world camp. What jujitsu has to fucking step up on is athletes need to be fucking paid better because it is so hard to make a living. Where like there are like three tournaments if you win, you're kind of a name, or you have to start like trying to shit talk. And by the way, I'm not. That's not uh, Gordon or Gary or even Dylan. Um, you know, those guys, that's just who they fucking are. Um, I'm talking about the blue belts and the purple belts in their comment section being like, <laughs> I guess I have to shit talk to like try to, you know, get famous. Um, th that there aren't, you know, everyone who wins an IBJJF uh, fucking goal should get fucking money at the black belt level. Um, yeah. uh, you know, we're, we're all paying to compete. Uh, in, in these things and it's so hard to make a living it's so hard uh, even to get seminars shit like that without being in the top tier there's no middle class for people like making a living there's you know there's a, there's an upper class and I think that until we can take care of our athletes and offer fucking viable solutions yeah dude if I'm a fucking 
uh, athlete who came over here from fucking Brazil and I have a bunch of kids and I want, and the only way to fucking make a living is to win every tournament. And in that tournament, everyone is using steroids. Like what the fuck am I supposed to do? Yeah, I agree. So basically we can't expect athletes to afford good steroids till we pay them. So we need to pay these athletes so they can get the good shit. Yeah. And we can have real competition. That was some fucking Canadian shit. They have free healthcare. They have free <laughs> ster- better steroids. That's right. Just go talk to your, do- your doctor. I need a little bit better steroids. Better steroids? We'll get you all the steroids. Yeah, just a little more natural, less chemically. Um, free range? Is that a thing? Free range. <laughs> grass-fed. <laughs> yeah, grass-fed steroids, please. <laughs> Um, okay, last question is, is it okay to try and tap your instructor? You can field this one first. Oh, what an interesting, okay. That's a fascinating question. So shout out to whoever, shout out to everybody, by the way. These are great questions. Um, thank you for sending them. You can send them every week uh, to Drew, who you guys all follow on Instagram, and me, who you should start following on Instagram, at the Jamie Kilstein, um, and we'll pick out the best ones for the week. Um, okay. There's a difference, right? I've had moments with black belt well-known instructors where I was like, that chokes in. And I've kind of let go because I've panicked. (laughs) And part of me lets go. I could say it's because of like respect. Part of me is also probably scared where I'm like, what the fuck is this guy going to (laughs) do? I hope this is okay to say. Uh, I had a guillotine, uh, guillotine's kind of my move. I had a, a pretty wicked mounted guillotine on Kenny, our, our, our guest on Kenny Florian. And I, now look, maybe he, you know, maybe he was going easy and I snatched it, whatever. And, uh, I heard some, I heard some choky noises and I started to let go a little bit. And, uh, and then Kenny got out. And then Kenny stopped me and was like, you fucking ease up on that? (laughs) And I was like, I don't know, man. I like didn't want to be a dick or something like that. And he was like, you can't fucking do that. Because if you do that in training, uh, it's going to come out in competition or whatever. You're building that habit, right? Of like loosening up. And I do that sometimes too, not just with like higher level people who, again, Kenny beats the shit out of me, just to be clear. Um, but, I mean, I do that on blue belts and stuff, too, especially because a guillotine's my move. I just, like, hit it from everywhere. But sometimes I'm like, ah, I know how to finish this. But that's actually going to make my guillotine shittier. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's just, like, a training thing. So, yeah, that's how you should train, I think. However, if you're going at your instructor, like, fucking, if I tap this motherfucker, I'm the new instructor. Like, if you're just being a spaz <laughs> and you're being super hard or if you weigh fucking 300 pounds and, you know, your instructor looks like a fucking meow brother, uh, then it's like, don't be a dick either, right? Like, um, I guess that would be my, like, people always tried to bring it to me because, like, there were black belts in my classes and I was a brown belt. So like, I kind of knew like I was like a little hunted when I was in Los Angeles Mm -hmm. Um, and purple belts would fucking go insane. Um, And, and I was kind of like, all right, I got to do, you know, like that I get, I mean, I wasn't like, there wasn't a fucking picture of me on a wall, but like, yeah, dude, like if when I rolled with here on Gracie, I just like charged at him and like fucking like formed him in the throat and like he would have every right to beat the piss out of me. (laughs) <laughs> okay so i can cover this from a couple angles because i am a full-time coach so i got I know, it from I'm, that I'm angle. Fast. i am so excited for your answer yeah sure so i got it from that angle but then i'll also sort of digress to when i wasn't and when i was coming up through the ranks and my feelings then and kind of how they mesh so as a full-time instructor now i i'm totally fine with people going hog wild because i trust in my jujitsu and i'm not too worried and this this could be um part of an affectation of this being a newer school i don't really have a whole lot of people that are at high elite levels that have to you know i have to be really careful with uh, that's not to shit talk my students there's some guys that give me good good roles all the time um but i'm not too i, I would there's no point to them going easy with me because they can turn it up to 100 and i'm okay um but when i was coming up I actually, I remember talking to a a friend of mine who was a black belt when I was a purple belt and his, um, 
affiliation and uh, leader was coming up who's a coral belt. And he was um, rolling. I saw a that, video. That, that really quick, just for people who don't know, that means you fight in the sea? <laughs> coral. <laughs> I never <laughs> thought of that. That's funny. You're, you're the king of the sea, <laughs> I, I believe. You had to fight some kind of King Trident type figure. <laughs> There's an Aquaman joke in there somewhere. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's probably uh, about how Zack Snyder is the fucking worst. <laughs> <laughs> It's probably not. That was for me. I'm sorry. Keep going. So anyways, Coral Belt, seventh degree black belt. Um, Jesus Christ. Yeah. That's fucking insane. Yeah. And uh, he was up and I saw a short video of, of him sort of doing some positional sparring with this Coral Belt who was like 50 years older than him. Yeah. And I asked him on the low afterwards on the DMs asking, is it all right to try to tap him like do you actually try to attack him or is that considered faux pas and he's he responded and said honestly at that level i'm just looking to learn every movement that i do with him i'm not even right. thinking about trying to tap i'm just trying to see how he moves and try to learn something from it that's fucking great so that could be the attitude for someone who is a little worried that they're maybe going too hard and are worried that they're insulting their instructor or something. Um, maybe the goal shouldn't be to tap them. Maybe the, the goal should be to see how they're beating or reacting to your moves. Yeah. Cause there have definitely been other times that I've rolled with instructors where I'm kind of like, yo, I'm fucking like running all over this guy. But then I'm like, oh, I didn't tap him. I didn't really come <laughs> close to a submission. And I'm like, oh, were they just kind of like toying and rolling around and playing defense and seeing what I would do? Because Girl, they're that happened they, to me they, a few times. Yeah, because like they're my instructor. So like, you know, like my biggest note from Sean Williams was always like slow the fuck down mm -hmm. and start using pressure more and start whatever. So there would be times where I would be like all speedy and like thought I was like, you know, like, oh, look what I'm doing. And then I'm like, Oh, I didn't get anything. Yeah, and exactly. he ended up on top at the very end. And then he was like, if his point is for me to slow down, he was probably just fucking giving me a lesson and showing me that I'm just going to run myself, you know, tired while he just kind of grambies and chills. And, yeah. you know, uh, so like they also could be teaching you like a really valuable lesson, which means, by the way, if they're going fucking easy on you, and you suddenly see a wrist lock and as hard as you can try to like double down on that. It's like, ugh, I don't know, man. I think the last angle on this question should be um, a good instructor should be teaching his students how to tap him. So at a certain point after, after training with a guy long enough, you should expect to be able to submit him because you're using the moves that he taught you that work. So that's yeah. kind of at a certain point, like a compliment to the instructor that you've learned well you beat me legitimately, yeah. and now you know you're you're on the road to success, dude. I started jujitsu with my baby brother, and we were I was like 17. I'm six years older than him. Can't do the math again. Learning disabilities, <laughs> um, and uh, you know we started at this SBG affiliate. Teacher was a blue belt in New Jersey, and me and my little brother, who fucking admired the shit out of me, like I smoke pot. He wanted to smoke pot. Like I listen to bad jam bands. He has a fish shirt. Like you know. And I remember, I will never forget this. And I, I 17, dude, and I still remember that, like, you know, I would run all over him, obviously. And, you know, now he, like, he started this first, like, MMA program in, like, India and had pro fight. Like, he's a fucking, wow. he's in law school. Um, like, he doesn't want to be a fighter, but he was, like, a D1 wrestler. Like, he, we've both, we talked about this the other day for the first time. Like, we started martial arts together. And just like a movie where you expect the brothers to come up together, we didn't. We both went on totally different paths. Uh, I went on comedy. He became a teacher, uh, traveled all over the world doing that. And then somehow in separate ways, we like both came back to MMA and jiu-jitsu, which is like really fucking cool. Um, but I remember he straight ankle locked me one day. And I was doing the thing where I was like, it's fine. It's fine. And then you're suddenly panicking. And I tap. And like, dude, it was like the scene in fucking Warrior. I like, like just such so many emotions came over me where I was like, man, this sucks. But also like he, he did this, it really good. <laughs> this is fucking awesome. You know? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's a great point. I'm really glad you brought that up. 
Well, guys, that was, that was fun. That was good questions. Feel free, like we're saying, to drop them each time we ask for them in the stories each week. We'll pick some good ones out of that. And man, I had a lot of fun talking to Kenny and I can't wait to get these next guests coming up. I'm fucking stoked. Yeah, you guys, uh, you guys are going to lose it. We've, uh, I forget what order everything has gone in. Are we doing an outro now? Or yeah, we, yeah. did we yeah, already interview Kenny? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we did. This is, this is us finishing off. This is us finishing the show. Great. Uh, I think we already did an outro. We've taped like three outros, you guys. Uh, you, you use whatever one you want. Edit out that horrible pause. Um, yeah, those were great questions. Uh, please keep sending the questions. We want to build uh, a community. We want this show to be very much, you know, jujitsu people get obsessed with jujitsu. And a lot of times, I did a show last night in Phoenix. And our friend Nate, 10th Planet uh, in Albuquerque, uh, sent one of his blue belts uh, to my show. Um, and this, he's this like little college kid. And we talk afterwards. And uh, he's with these two like very pretty, like cool looking girls. Like I was like, go be with the cool people. <laughs> and uh, me and him just start talking about jujitsu. And we start talking about Nate. And I was like, uh, the girls came and they were like, come on. And I was like, sorry, we were talking about jujitsu. And they were like, we figured. Um, <laughs> because that's all jujitsu people want to talk about, especially white belts and blue belts. So we want this to be a fucking community. We want this to start infiltrating fucking gyms. Um, and so please, like, we want it to be fucking interactive, you guys. So obviously, we want you to spread the word about the show, but also, like, get fucking involved. Jujitsu people are cool fucking people. And, like, Drew and I just want to, like, get to know you guys, help out, commiserate, all that shit. That's right. Get on the YouTube, subscribe on there, drop comments, get to iTunes, drop five star reviews on that to help bump this thing so other people can see it. Share it to your group chats and your in your teammates and teams. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna get this shit around. It's going to get fucking huge, guys. We're going to get to the point where we're going to build a community. We're going to tour with this show. We're going to interview fucking everybody you want to hear from like, like I'm going to get fucking Joe Rogan. I'm going to figure it out. It may take a year, uh, but we want to get Sam Harris. Rob Wolf all wants to do the show. Who's like this like paleo expert, New York Times bestselling author. Um, Kevin Lee's going to come on the show. I think that'll be probably soon. Oh, since I'm not in Vegas, we'll get to do that together so we can Skype with him. Um, he just had the, the, the fucking bonus like who would have thought that kevin got the bonus on a fucking card with nick diaz jorge masvidal uh darren till but he he made a fucking statement dude um and he texted me some stuff that he wanted to say to rogan uh <laughs> about uh trump with trump in the audience oh um, so we'll talk about that on the show nice. it's good. It'll, good. It'll, it'll get good it'll it'll be very clickbaity you guys <laughs> all right we'll see you then guys uh take care make sure to check back for future episodes yep Thank you guys so much for listening. Thank you for supporting the podcast and uh, we'll see you next week. Awesome. Bye.